Hello, shalom. Thank you for joining me this amazing festival and amazing work to Eris. We were supposed to have a discourse between me and brother Rohan Marley tonight, but for unforeseen events, he won't be able to make it. <clears throat> we're going to rain check, and so I'm going to give a little bit of a thought process now about what we were going to go and discuss. And uh, the next conversation between us will be posted to the YouTube. So without further ado, I'm going to start, and thank you again. So this kind of starts the conversation, at least between Rohan and myself, was going to start with his spiritual school of thought. You know, when I first met him, we we're sitting at an event together, and I just happened to be next to him, and I looked, and he had a Star of David on. And I, I said to him, hey, you know, I looked at him, I saw the Star of David, I take out my tzitzis, I showed him my kippah, and we were brothers. But what really made us brothers, besides the fact that we were just, you know, good guys that got along, was that from his school of thought, from his spiritual school of thought, their spiritual identity, information, legacy, comes from King Solomon. Same thing that the Jewish people say. So what's going on? So we're going to take a little deep dive into that topic, and we're going to end into how humanity can liberate and heal itself. So here we go. First things first, just regarding King Solomon. King Solomon had a thousand wives and... A lot of people around the world today claim to be from him, including the Ethiopian Empire. Some people come to me and say, hey, Harry, you know, King Solomon was living the best life. He had a lot of pleasure, a thousand wives. He must have really been enjoying himself. And so I say, it couldn't have been that the wisest man on earth was so busy chasing around pleasures. We even know that he, he did try every pleasure in the world, and he wrote it wasn't worth it all. It was nothing. So what was really going on in the mind of King Solomon when he says you know, a thousand wives. <clears throat> My theory is that King Solomon, because he was the wisest man alive, knew about genetics, epigenetics, and passing on genetics. And he figured to himself, I'm such a peaceful, loving, caring man that my genetics would be good on earth. I mean, that could be a dangerous thought. We saw that with Genghis Khan, but with King Solomon, he was just saying, gotta spread my seed. And uh, so basically you see that King Solomon had a thousand wives. So what I theorize is to have his seed spread throughout the whole earth. So thousands of years later, there'll be a lot of descendants with the genetics in them of love and music and tolerance and good hope. So <clears throat> now that we have King Solomon spreading his seed, we don't know where they went. They could have gone across the whole world. One place we do know for sure they went is in Ethiopia through Menelik, the son of Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. And since that time, there's been an establishment of the seed of David in Ethiopia, and after the fact, an Israelite presence in Ethiopia, one of the longest Israelite exiles in the entire world. Hold on one second, I'm just going to let the events coordinator know. Just a reminder, this is for the Festival of Lights Festival. I'm going to let Erez know we're on. Um, hold on. Sorry about that. So back to it. <clears throat> now what I find very interesting is you see that this school of thought of Ethiopian spirituality, which people could refer to as Rastafarianism, there's other names for it, ends up making its way to the Caribbeans and to Jamaica and to the islands out there. So what's going on there? Are these people from the Ethiopian exile or is there something else happening? So when you look into it, it's very interesting that the government of Israel has a website where they list all the diaspora communities around the world. And one of the largest mentioned communities in this report that they put together was the Igbo tribe of Western Africa. And they mentioned the word descendants of Jews, Jewish identity, Jewish customs. But you actually look at the Western African uh, slave trade, the diaspora that came from West Africa towards the Americas, the Igbo and other tribes that share ancestry with them made up a large percentage of this transatlantic slave trade. And I've sp spoken about this a lot. But what I find interesting now is these individuals in the Jamaica and the Caribbeans, somehow the spiritual school of thought of King Solomon through the Ethiopian royalty that traces back to him, as we know Haile Selassie traced back to be a direct male descendant of King Solomon, makes its way to the descendants of an 
another Israelite community that resonated with that message. So I found that to be very interesting, and there's something there. And if you actually look at Bob Marley, Roland's father, you see that seed of King Solomon of love and righteousness and humanity flourishing. So it must be that the theory that King Solomon thought of thousands of years ago would make sense. So let's keep going for a sec. It's about to get very interesting. Now, <clears throat> so we have a situation where we have the transatlantic slave trade bringing people that the government of Israel recognizes as being from the seed of Israel to the Americas. So what do we do about all this right now? Because there's different groups of people with different identities, and you know, a lot of people will look at me and say, Harry, are you trying to go out and convert individuals? Are you trying to make one massive world religion? And I think that this is a seed that's been planted to have nothing to do with religion, but really the freedom of humanity. It says in the Talmud that the difference between the days of the Mashiach and not the days of the Mashiach is the yoke of the nations off of our shoulders, basically no middlemen. So we'll leave that up in the air for now and we'll wrap up with that. But basically, when you have all these individuals that are saying that they're from the same family line, you have an opportunity of peer-to-peer -peer nation building that doesn't involve middlemen. So there's already an opportunity, according to the Talmud, which is basically the oldest, one of the oldest blockchains of Mosaic law, we have uh, within it a recipe for decentralization. So let's go into this for a second and see what happens. We know based on what we said about King Solomon's theory before of spreading a seed, and we also know from science, there's something called epigenetics, a genetic memory that's stored in our DNA that can get triggered. And what's happening now is you're seeing certain people doing healing work, tapping into their epigenetics. So for example, there's two fascinating different examples, but <clears throat> with plant medicine, psychedelic plant medicine, you'll see a lot of reports of African Americans from the transatlantic slave trade taking plant medicine to heal from whatever traumas or PTSD in their life, uh, which these things should be only done in healing settings uh, with professionals, but they're having flashbacks and visions of being running in fields and being slaves or dealing with visions that their ancestors may have dealt with in this space and is arousing something in their soul for a spiritual awakening. Just as, as just in the same note, I had a friend uh, from the Jewish community who unfortunately had a very bad addiction. Let me take a little sip. <clears throat> and he went to do a plant medicine to kick himself with the addiction because these aren't really drugs. They're anti-addiction medicines that get people off their drugs. And he had a clinical report afterwards where they were asking him trial questions saying, hey, how do you feel now, what, X, Y, Z. And they said to him, hey, did you have any Holocaust visions by any chance? And my friend said, no, not really. And then he started thinking about it. He said, wait a minute, yeah. Uh, the whole entire time I was actually, there was parts where I was running from Nazi Germany and I was fleeing and it was scary and I was terrified. I was going through all these visions. And he said, why would you even know to ask me that? And they said, well, a large percentage of Jews who have ancestry in the Holocaust go into Holocaust visions because perhaps somewhere in, in their epigenetics, in their DNA, is stored trauma from such a long time ago. So that's something that I found very interesting and I want to take that and apply it to another level much deeper because there's a few sections this concept of the scattered house of Israel would apply to when it comes to epigenetics and healing and the most the biggest elephant in the room I, I see is happening here in Israel on the ground. <clears throat> Conservatively, you have about 25% of the Palestinians, or quote-unquote Palestinian, because, <clears throat> excuse me again, there is no such thing as a Palestinian people or a nation. There's Arabic-speaking families who, some have been living in Israel for 2,000 years, some have been here for a few hundred years for econo economic opportunity, but nonetheless, we can identify 25% conservatively of the Arab-speaking families in Israel who have Jewish roots, who come from Jews who have gone through forced conversions. And now it's not individuals. It's not like, oh, this guy, yes, this guy, no. It's actually villages and clans. So we can go around on a map and show you, hey, this village has Israelite ancestry. This village has Israelite ancestry. And show one by one um, their last names, you know, Jewish... Uh, relicas hidden under the floorboards, places on the walls where mezuzahs would have been. So you see there's clearly a Jewish ancestry here. 
and then all of a sudden you look, start to look at the stat statistics and these individuals from these Jewish communities who were once Jewish are making up a majority of the terrorist attacks in Israel. So a lot of the terrorism in Israel is specifically coming from villages of humans that were once Jewish. So that's a crazy thing just to process. You know, when I'm out on the West Coast or talking to people who are trying to have an opinion and be really liberal and loving everyone and caring, it's like, wait, time out. I don't even think you know what's going on in the land. There's a whole backward situation. And what I find interesting also is we say, Ma'aseh avot simon labanim. What happens to the forefathers in our Torah is a foreshadow for future generations. And we see there is a story in the Torah where two brothers were face to face, Joseph and Judah in Egypt. And Judah did not know Joseph was Joseph. He didn't know who he was. He was second in command of all over Egypt. He looked like an Egyptian. They're standing in the same room staring at each other. And Joseph knew who he was, Joseph, and he knew who Judah was. So one brother knew of who he was, and he knew who the other brother was. One brother knew who he was, but not who the other brother was. And it says Judah was about to take out his sword, kill Joseph and everyone in the room and all of Egypt. And he could have done it. These guys were ninjas. And all of a sudden, a split second before his sword came out and sliced and diced, it was a revelation. Joseph's like, oh, I'm your brother. And they hugged and they healed. And if we believe in the reality that what happens in the Torah is a foreshadow for future generations, then we have an interesting stage that's been set today as you have people in the land of Israel right now who are really come from the Jewish people, and they know it. If you ask them, they'll self-identify. You could be in a taxi driver, in a taxi car in Israel, you'll have an Arabic-speaking driver. You'll say to him, hey, are you from the tribes here that come from the Jews? He'll either say, yes, I am, you're my brother, and you bro out, Oracle say, no, I'm not, but I 100% know where those tribes are. Yeah, they're in this village, this village, everyone knows. There's even a derogatory term used for them called Mustarabim, like you're a hidden Arab. We see this term was uh, referred to, to like uh, similar to the Muranos or the Conversos, a derogatory term that was put on an individual who was once Jewish who now has to be in another religion or another identity. So it's likely that that trauma of not having acceptance amongst who they are and the Jewish people not knowing who they are, they don't have a real identity. The Arabs don't recognize them as pure-blood Arabs. The Jews say, hey, I don't know who you are. The Jews have no clue what I'm talking about if I say this, but they just have to look into it and see its facts. That there's a situation here of two brothers face-to-face -face again. It, it doesn't take a lot of research. You could just look at, um, let's say, for example, there's a lot of examples, but this is a very famous one, Ari Fold. A legend, the Tzaddik, a righteous man who was unfortunately murdered. But if you look at the name of the village his killer came from, from all the articles, it was Yata. Just go to Google, go to Wikipedia, type in Yata, and it will tell you this is a historical Jewish village. This has been Jewish for almost 2,000 years, and something, you know, something happened. All the people in the village have last names that mean winemaker, and they're hiding to fill in from, you know, 1400 Spain under floorboards. It's a whole entire thing, and it's the whole village, and they know it. It's an elephant in the room. So now when we're dealing with plant healing and epigenetics, if there is within these individuals a memory of being from the House of Israel, perhaps for research or clinical purposes, a few of them who are already willing and volunteering should undergo you know, PTSD plant healing. First of all, that's just strategic anyway, because if they're dealing in a conflict, you don't want to make decisions from fight or flight or anger. You want to be strategically representing your people. You want to be in the most healed version of yourself if you're going to be representing your people in freeing yourself. So let's say there's a clinical trial done with some of these individuals who have Jewish roots and who are making up a large percentage of the of the terrorists in of, is, of Israel. And epigenetically, they're, they're restoring some type of memory from their past or their healing. This could be groundbreaking. This could be a whole entire situation uh, where we see healing. Now this is kind of where I come in and I'm wearing this hat trippy is to help move this agenda forward of giving people access to healing and to epigenetics. And again, this is not something recreational. I'm not saying go explore some plants so you can have a good time. These are for people who are trapped inside of their brain in a state of absolute torture, who don't want to be alive anymore. They don't want to be alive anymore so much that they're willing to go take a knife and walk and stab someone knowing they're going to get shot a few minutes later. These are people who don't have the desire to live anymore. So that is where medicine comes in. There's a sickness. So when there's a sickness, there's medicine. So I'm not saying, oh, let's bring in plants to heal the Middle East. No, let's bring in plants to heal people who are really suffering in their brains because that's what certain plants on the planet do. 
And it happens to be that those people who are healing have Jewish roots in them that could possibly get activated, where it's not even about conversion, and we'll go into that right now, it's just about brotherhood. So what does brotherhood have to do with everything? And this is the beautiful thing about uh, Web3 and blockchain and the hat I'm wearing, Trippy, which we'll discuss a little bit now. Um, so we created a DAO, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which is a structure of governance of a company, basically, for the future, where you could still have a for-profit company that acts like a company. It doesn't have to be a non-for-profit or a charity, but the ownership is governed by a large group of humans, whose ownership is through the form of governance and not about making money. So there should be a reality where people can make money for impact investing, doing impact moves, without having to answer to investors in skies and suit and ties. I know I'm wearing a tie, but not have to answer, answer to them to say, where's the bottom line? Because we don't want to mix, where's the bottom line? How are we going to make money when it comes to healing people who are suffering inside of the brain? You want to keep a sacred space between that. And the power of the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization, allows that to happen, where large groups of people can chip in collectively, put in capital, and use that capital to make impact allocations. So we've created this DAO called Trippy.vc, and ownership within the DAO is through NFT holding. Um, NFT really is just utility, so an NFT could be owning art, or it could be owning a piece of a DAO. So there's a lot of people who are doing a lot of shady things with NFTs, and there's really projects without utility, and they just crumble. But if there's a project that takes capital and does something with it, and all the DAO members have a share or access to it, this is really the power of Web3 that will alleviate suffering in humanity and give us an opportunity to explore more peer-to-peer -peer decentralized type of networking amongst individuals. So now that we've launched this DAO, thank God we raised some capital through very meaningful, impactful families, we have an opportunity to allocate that capital towards helping heal the world. So there are companies now in Israel, um, just like in the 1960s when THC was identified in the cannabis plant, which was amazing for people who are sick and in pain and need that. Um, not talking about recreational use, I'm just talking about people who are suffering. They're doing the same now with psychedelics in Israel where they're saying, hey, we can identify the specific chemicals within specific plants that will cause certain states of minds to happen. So if someone's suffering from drug addiction, there's certain isolated chemicals that will help them. If someone has PTSD, if someone's a terrorist and is trying to kill other people, there's a whole different array of plants in this world. So Israel's probably leading the world right now in this type of R&D and discovery. So we hope to take some of the capital, place it in there safely. And as everyone knows, or if you don't know, I have a big farm up north in Israel uh, where we're going to be building set and setting for humans to come together to heal and leveraging our access to this uh, study and this R&D of bringing people's minds back to order. Now, while all this is going on, <clears throat> we still have a situation of 100 million people around the world who say they're from the House of Israel. So obviously the plan isn't to bring psychedelics around the whole world, or at least that's not my plan. If the universe wants it, that's up to them to awaken people. But we already have an opportunity to use Web3, use the technology to to create a peer-to-peer -peer network amongst these people without middlemen, as we're going to remind that the practical difference between the Mashiach and the non-Mashiach, according to the Talmud, is the yoke of the nations off of our shoulders. So all of a sudden, if there's a way that people in Afghanistan who say they're Bani Israel, the children of Israel, 50 million Pashtun, and the people of Nigeria, uh, the Igbo, 40, close to 40 million, and that's where our brother Rudy Rothman got arrested because they were suspectful that he was coming to create a Jewish state over there, shows the fear of the government. They arrested a, an Israeli, American, French citizen for the conspiracy that they thought that these individuals were coming to help decentralize the Biafrans who tried on their own in 1960s but didn't have Web3 technology to do it. So now that we have an opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer networking amongst these individuals, it's really not about religion. It's really going to be about the decentralization. And this comes back to kind of King Solomon's seed that he had a thousand wives spilled his seed across the whole world. There is Davidic DNA all throughout the world right now. And that's going to arouse itself and awaken itself in the future. And you look in the story of Purim um, 2,500 years ago, it says from Ethiopia to India, people were mityahadim, they converted, they became part of the house of Israel. So some people say, did they convert and they didn't know about it? Or some people were saying, no, they already knew they had Davidic line in them. The seed of David spread throughout the Silk Road through King Solomon's strategic diplomatic relationships. That these individuals then 
adapted to the blockchain of the Torah when they saw in Babylon there were still scholars from the first temple period like Mordechai who are holding down the law of Moses perfectly and these other individuals who are in exile across the Silk Road were like wow that's legit we want to adapt to this we see that happened in other communities like the Bukharians who were in uh, that region of the world from first temple period and then only let's say in the year 7 or 800 900 linked up with the Gaonim of Babylon where the law of Moses was very strong and took it upon themselves to upkeep the preserved law as the yeshivas of Israel have held, which are still till today. But like I said, the oldest blockchain of Mosaic law in the world, even though there are other, other, other blockchains, Davidic blockchains of families that claim to be from King David. But it's not about any of that. It's not about religion, and it's not about converting. It's about freedom of humanity. And what I find super most interesting about the whole thing is that if you look at these main regions that I just pointed out, <clears throat> Israel, Afghanistan, and Nigeria is there's destabilization in these regions. And if you look at the history of them, I think one of the main causes of the destabilization is foreign borders that were drawn by third-party European countries. So let's say the British come in to Afghanistan, draw the Durand line right in the middle of Afghanistan and Pakistan, and they take what was once by Afrin and, and you know, a federation of tribes that have been governing themselves uh, for whoever knows how long, all of a sudden amalgamate them into Nigeria with other tribes they didn't historically get along with and now have other tribes ruling over them and creating issues. Um, and you look at Israel and you see that these lines were drawn, the banks and then the green line and all these different color lines they have. Um, these were third party rulership that coming in and trying to draw borders to create their own stability and their own political agendas. And we're still dealing with them today like, oh, no, that's a real border. That's just what it is from God. It's like, no, that was some crazy stuff where crazy guys came in and started doing that. And now we have to do a rollback. We have to figure out how do we do self-governance again um, in a manner that's healthy and doesn't lead to anarchy and chaos. And again, that's what I think Web3, um, the healing of uh, you know plants combined together, will really give access to that. Now, it's not such a coincidence that the English were trying to do this. Because according to the English, from their own school of thought, they claim to be from, guess what, Davidic dynasty. The Queen of England will claim, and their family line will say, their royal Davidic bloodlines. And we can't even rule it out. We wouldn't know from a hole in the wall if that was true or if that wasn't true. Because the seed of David through Solomon spread throughout the whole world. So we don't know if they really are or if they're not. But I can tell you one thing. They tried to do what the vision of the prophets were of a one world order, one world kingdom. So that's why it's called the United Kingdom and why they tried to set up colonies around the whole world. Everyone, when you hear New World Order, people get very creeped out. But the reality of the future will be a New World Order. It will be a one world uh, decentralization. That's freedom. But it may not be in the manner that other humans have attempted a New World Order in the past or still attempting today. So it's probably what's going on today is there's a battle for New World Orderhood. Um, on one side, you have ancient fraternities, so, you know, who've historically been doing some really dark things and doing evil things to other humans for their own self game. And the other one is you have the prophecies of the redemption of Israel, the reunification of the people of Israel, which we do say in the, in the prophets will be a new world order and it will be a great time of peace and harmony. Excuse me. So we shouldn't get creeped out by the concept of a new world order. We should just really try to push very hard in a direction towards a healthy one that would lead to middlemen nations not harvesting our human capital for their gain and not abiding by archaic laws and lines that were drawn by people who historically have done evil acts and didn't align themselves with righteousness. So the convergence of this international family that's going to form and help lead to a decentralization combined with the human's ability to heal with plants and tap into epigenetic memories and restore something that they once were and come together with peace and love playing some Bob Marley in the background I think we have a formula for a redemption of humanity that doesn't involve anything metaphysical or any miracles this is on us this is a peer-to-peer -peer situation we were given the tools so in the meanwhile, we just have to stay very optimistic because in this time, it's a very dark time. A lot of mental health issues, a lot of people are bugging out. But that's specifically when the asset called faith can come into play. 
there's ever a time to have faith, it's today when things seem the darkest. It was when that moment when Judah was about to take out his sword and kill Joseph in Egypt, at that very moment where it seemed it wasn't possible to go any lower, boom, redemption. So I think if we look at the elephants in the room that I had pointed out in this last little conversation, we see there's enough fodder in the redemption salad bowl to just overnight pop up with something beautiful. And that's why we founded Trippy.vc to try to push the agenda forward. Uh, what we've learned, there's a lot of amazing people there pushing this same agenda forward from their specific angles. And it's really important that without ego, we unconditionally lock arms, link up, form a brother and sisterhood of good humans who could uh, take these matters. And we shouldn't debate anymore uh, you know, about the, the things that are distractions from these main topics of contention that the House of Israel was brought to the Americas, you know, that there are people in Israel who are terrorists who were once Jewish, that there's plants that are now um, illegal that were designed to heal us from these situations because for-profit companies created pharmaceutical pills that um, enslave us and make them very wealthy just so they can upkeep the cycle of them manifesting their version of the New World Order. So we shouldn't be afraid of the opposition we're up against because they're nourishing themselves from us. We're the humans and we have the, the human capital within us. <clears throat> and uh, I was just doing a time check because we can keep going, but that was kind of like a micro wrap up for now. I appreciate uh, everyone who followed along. And just a reminder, this was a substitute conversation between myself and Rohan Marley, who was under the weather today. And we're gonna rain check that conversation posted on the festival YouTube page. Uh, lots of love and respect to Erez, and uh, we should be worthy for a great decentralization in a healthy manner that brings healing and love to all. Shalom. Stay strong. Over now. This is my first one, so i got to figure out how to end it. I see the finish button right here. Appreciate everyone.